I'd like to thank the environmental panelists for reminding us of uh, the threats of uh, both the <coughs> line as well as what can happen to the coast. Uh, we didn't even talk about what could happen to the sacred headwaters of the Nass and the Stikine and uh, the Skeena River, which the pipeline will go through. And that's something that we should all be very humbled by and concerned about. Um, and thank you, Terry Inker, for um, bringing up regulation and how workers need regulations to do their jobs properly. If we lived in that kind of society, maybe this conversation wouldn't have so many edges to it. Um, my <coughs> question really is, is that this, I know you can only do so much in any forum, but this panel is really in the paradigm of oil. Uh, and the black stuff is killing us, you know? And we really need to uh, think about this alternate energy piece. And so what I'd really like to comment on before I leave tonight is what's the bigger picture? We've got a number of MPs here. What's the big picture uh, for a national policy? I've heard one person say uh, a national energy policy. I mean, I thought the Fraser Institute and the Berkeley think tanks beat that out of us, but maybe we should be talking about that again. What about um, some of the green energy kept in public control? What can we do about that uh, to, to make it so that we're not so dependent on oil? Because I think there's a lot of danger to oil. We talk about uh, the tankers going into these Aboriginal communities with uh, diesel. Diesel is a really, it's a number one uh, carcinogen. So we really have to get to some alternate energy. Uh, what are some of the bigger pictures that the environmentalists or the MPs have for that? Okay, I think what we'll do is just come back to our panelists. Uh, we have a number of questions being raised. So anybody would like to address, we can have a little more at this time. Well, uh, a number of questions and comments. Uh, in, in terms of the big picture, I guess to start backwards and, and try to deal with a couple of these questions quickly. Um, yeah, I, you know, for me, we could talk until we're blue in the face about tanker safety, even if we have zero accidents, whether we're shipping it through Tawasin or the North or Vancouver Harbor. At the end of the day, as a climate activist, it, it, it kind of drives me nuts. I feel like I'm banging my head against the wall sometimes. I feel like I'm saying, your house is on fire, and people say, well, maybe we should change the color of the paint. You know, because really the, the issue that we're talking about is, is at a much bigger scale. It's the federal government, and it's the relationship between the federal government and other countries in the world that's going to have to deal with this issue of the role that oil plays in our world. Um, and I think one of the biggest myths is that there's nothing that we can do to replace oil. Uh, there's some things that are more difficult than others, like agriculture is very oil dependent and, and a big issue. But as far as transportation goes, we've actually got a lot of those solutions in place now. Uh, and in the next 30 some odd years, the existing stock of cars and energy uh, production facilities is going gonna, is gonna to be dead. And we're going to need to replace that stuff. Um, you know, so the question is, are we replacing it with green alternatives? Or are we building more of the same stuff that just makes the problem worse? Uh, I, and I think when you look at it that way, it's actually not such a big thing to deal with. It's really just a matter of choices, and those are the choices that our elected officials make on our behalf. Um, you know, so in that sense, I think we need to be looking from that much larger perspective. Uh, and thanks, May, for bringing up uh, you know the, the toxins as, as it relates to all this, because I mean, those that this oil ends up in somebody's automobile, and, and you know, turns into a major source of benzene and carcinogens that you know we're all breathing. We're all living in the equivalent of living with a secondhand smoker, just dealing with all the exhaust coming from our automobiles. You know, so this, this issue is, I think, a lot bigger than, than just whether we can make tankers safe or not. Um, one thing, though, that I do think really needs to be addressed is we've heard that it's nothing new for these tankers to be on our coast. And the distinction that I'm really trying to make here is that since 2007, we've had crude oil from the Athabasca tar sands moving through tankers off the coast of British Columbia. Uh, there's been refined fuels moving up and down the coast and perhaps some exports of, of unrefined crude. But the really big difference is large volumes of unrefined crude oil, really heavy, thick stuff, moving up and down uh, our coast and, and potentially more and more of it going to China. Um, you know, so the question is, is that a direction that actually makes sense for the future of our country, for the, for the future of the, of the planet as we deal with climate change? And I simply think the answer is, is, is obvious to anybody who looks at it even for a second that it just is not. Uh, and in terms of the kinds of investments and the direction we should be moving, it's just the wrong trajectory for us to be moving. I think the other thing that's important to keep in mind about this debate when I hear people say, oh, well, you know, we can't phase out oil and we can't do that. Well, you know what? It's really easy for us to say that because of where we are and the position of privilege that we hold in this world. Because we got to the place where we are by using oil and various other resources, and we're at a point now where the way that we use those resources is literally killing people. And if we were the ones being killed, that decision would not be 
quite so easy to just flippantly make. Because the fact of the matter is that there literally are people dying, hundreds of thousands to millions of people dying, and not sometime later than now, right now. And that means that we need to do something to fix this situation, because if we don't, in my opinion, we have done a great injustice to the people of this world and to the generation that will inherit this planet, including me and my children, if I wanted to have children, which quite frankly, it, with the way the world is going now, I don't. And I think that that is very, very sad. And the other thing that I wanted to add is that I have great confidence that the men on this panel do their job very, very well, and that the vast majority of tankers who move, that move around the world do so with a grace and skill that is admirable. But the fact of the matter is that when one accident happens, one, one, wherever it happens, that cannot be cleaned up. That cannot be repaired, and that cannot be undone. So we have to ask ourselves, sure, we might be able to continue on like this in this happy place where we can continue shipping things in and out with no risk, but is that small risk, and it is small, but once it happens, it seems a lot bigger than it does right now, looking at these graphs and looking at these percentages. Because the fact of the matter is, the percentages don't matter when the oil reaches the water. I'll respond to the first speaker, Rod, I think it was. He, you asked about the salt ship, Rod. You're absolutely right. We, we absolutely did have a problem. The problem, and you are correct in your assumption that the uh, discharge loader from the ship had broken down. So if it had stayed there, it, would have broke, it could have broken in half. Absolutely right. So we were caught between a rock and a hard place as pilots. Get it off in a strong current and get as many tugs out there as you could. And it was a really difficult situation. There's no question about it. So now that the, uh, the bull has left the, uh, the corral, so to speak, changes were made. I'd like to go back to tankers, though, because that ship went in knowing that if the tide fell and they didn't get the cargo out, it was going to touch bottom. The tankers alongside the dock are never in any danger of touching bottom. They come in with sufficient water, fully laden, so that is not an issue. But they, they could somehow lose their, their motors, they could drift into the bank, and then you'd have a similar situation. With the, the one big difference with the tankers that we presently have is that the escorts are there and ready to go. With the, and I believe it was the uh, Chiello, forget the name. But the tankers have three vessels tied up. We have tested it in real life, we have tested it in the simulations, and we have over and over again put the rudder hard over towards the bank, straightened the vessel out, and taken it straight through the, the bridge with the rudder jammed hard over. The, the chances are less for a tanker than for a freighter having an incident, because the freighters in Burberry don't have the same number of escort tugs. I, I, I realize that you have the instrument with the tugs. I want to go back to the mic if you can, uh, when we've heard other people. After we've heard everybody wants to speak, we'll go to a second round. But if, if um, After that accident, they, Kevin, they, they, they purchased, the, they're now purchasing how many, uh, a couple of million dollars worth of tax? Four new tugs, because of the last four Excuse worked. me, there are other people who are still ahead of you, so I said if you want to come back on a second round, that's fine. Thanks. Yeah. Anybody else want to respond? Terry? Um, I, to a large extent, agree with the uh, uh, with your position in terms of the world needs to change, um, and I don't think uh, I think that my generation has done a really poor job of maintaining this world, and we do need to change things. But in the meantime, until we change things, we need to do things properly. It's going to be done, and we need to do it right. Uh, and I wish you all the luck and, the, and your generation to have better success than my generation had at changing the world. Because the world needs to change. But uh, right now, we've got, to, we've got to deal with what we've got and do it right and protect the best we can. Okay, uh, we'll go back to the mics. Yeah. Yes, Bill. Uh, John asked specifically about the, uh, I guess, the politics around the moratorium and the exclusion zone. I don't know the answer to that question. Maybe somebody else on the on the panel does, but uh, I can't answer your question, John. So, 
I mean, Ola, we, I mean, I can add something to that. And we're aware that it's not a legally binding, you know, there's no written agreement. Um, so, but it's, but I think it's been commonly called a moratorium.